Power creep is one of the most hotly debated issues when it comes to long-running series, as the feeling of having something to reach for is vital for an interesting story. In this two-part miniseries, we'll be taking a look at a couple of shows that both do it right and wrong. Note that this is just my opinion, so you're completely free to agree or disagree with what I'm saying. In the first video, we'll be examining series that, in my opinion, manage the escalation of odds and power perfectly. Those two being JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, specifically Part 3, and Avatar The Last Airbender. I will be spoiling some details of both shows and a tiny bit of Legend of Korra as well, so do keep that in mind. The reason I chose these two shows is because they both have completely different forms of progression, with Avatar being finite, but JoJo featuring a nearly infinite path of power progression. But we will talk about that more specifically for each series. So, without further ado, let's begin with Avatar. As mentioned before, the way I see Avatar's power progression is by it being finite. What I mean by that is that we essentially know the power ceiling of bending already. No matter what, a more powerful bender would still use the same four elements that we know, with the only exceptions being lightning, metal and bloodbending, but we'll touch on those separately as well. There is clearly a massive power jump between the first episodes and the last. Just look at these side-by-side -side comparisons of Aang's avatar state. It is obvious that Aang could not defeat the Fire Lord at the beginning of the series, so some sort of progression must obviously occur. For Avatar, this of course happens throughout the whole series. Right at the beginning, we are given a single clear goal. Aang must learn all of the elements. So they go on a journey where they are constantly improving their bending. Also, whenever Aang has to master a new element, there is a clear mini-training arc, which demonstrates how Aang must think differently to learn this new power. These training arcs are crucial to make power jumps feel realistic. Aang never just gets the abilities right away. He is forced to work for them, and then constantly practice throughout the show. Even in Book 3, there are times where Katara has waterbending lessons with Aang, the element that he first learned way back in Book 1. Aang's power increase is essentially linear, with a few spikes whenever he learns a new element. We could dissect the specifics of Aang's power growth, but I will give you just a few examples. First of which is during Sozin's Comet. Before Aang learned earthbending, his fighting style was always reliant on agility and extremely evasion-based. After meeting Toph and learning to take his challenges head-on, he encased himself in Earth and tried to block Ozai's fire head-on. This is, of course, Toph's technique. The second one I'd like to point out is the fight with the assassin sent by Zuko, or the much more fittingly named Sparky Sparky Boom Man. The fight begins with Aang evading the initial strikes. After failing to deliver a strike of his own and getting blown away, Aang once again takes Toph's advice and instead of airbending himself to the ground, faces his challenge head-on and goes straight through the large pillar. After realizing that his initial approach to the fight is not working, he uses what he learned from King Boomy, Neutral Jing. He hides in the pillar and waits for his opportunity to strike. Once he deems that is the right time, he jumps out and can be propelled by the Sparky Sparky Boom Man right up to Appa and escape. There are countless callbacks like this to the specific techniques that Aang has learned from the characters around him. He never suddenly gets a power jump that allows him to win the fight. When he is outmatched, he loses or he runs. Just like with Sparky Sparky Boom Man and the Season 2 finale, where Team Avatar was completely beat. Let's switch from Aang to Zuko, who also has an extremely important power progression. One of the very first scenes we get with Zuko is of him training with Uncle Iroh, so just like Aang, he constantly has background power progression as well. What's different for Zuko is that he doesn't only become more powerful with his element, he also becomes much more powerful as a bender himself. At the beginning of the series, he fueled his bending with anger, which quite literally blew up in his face when he tried to master lightning redirection. Due to not fully understanding the power he wields, he would always lose to Azula, whose bending was much more calculated and precise. After finally realizing what his uncle Iroh had been teaching him and training with the dragons, Zuko understood the true source of firebending. With these teachings, in his final Agni Kai, Zuko was already more powerful than Azula, 
by simply knowing that Katara was there to support him. The only reason Azula was able to hit Zuko was because she exploited the fact that Zuko would protect her at all costs. If you look at his bending form, it is also extremely disciplined. It is not rigid and fueled by his anger. He precisely deflects Azula's devastating strike and then retaliates with a calculated strike of his own, almost as if letting go of a held breath. Remind you of anything? Power in fire bending comes from the breath, not the muscles. All in all, Zuko's power doesn't simply grow because he gets more powerful. It also comes from him changing the way he approaches the problem. If he was to blindly attack, even with his new more powerful bending, he still would have lost, as Azula's technique would have outmatched his. But as we see their roles reversed, with Azula slowly losing her mind and becoming more and more reckless, Zuko is able to take her on. Now, onto the special bending powers we see in the series. Those being Toph's metal bending, blood bending, and lightning. In other series, these may be used as massive power boosts for the main characters. But in Avatar, they are simply extensions of the already existing bending. You may argue that Azula hitting Aang with lightning is one of those moments, but I would have to disagree with you, as I believe it just showed us how cold-blooded Azula was and how dangerous this special technique is. If Aang were to use it later, then I would agree, but he does the complete opposite. When faced with it again when fighting Ozai, he could immediately win the fight by redirecting it back at the Fire Lord, but he does not. This is the case for both Zuko and Uncle Iroh. They never use lightning themselves, they only redirect it. In my opinion, lightning in Avatar is just used to show us that these characters are essentially cold-blooded killers, as the only ones we actually see using it are Azula and the Fire Lord. As for metal bending, similarly to lightning, it is not a superpower that suddenly made Toph ten times more powerful. I think it more so shows her personal growth as a bender. In order to come up with the idea of metal bending in the first place, she had to change the way she approached problems, just like Aang and just like Zuko. Once captured, the only thing she did was shout that she would beat them up and so on, but once she finally calmed down and embraced some of that neutral jing, she realized that metal was just another form of earth. And yes, in this case, it did give Toph a way to get out of the cage she wouldn't have had otherwise, but we've already seen that she could take them on in a fight without breaking a sweat if she needed to. So I don't really think that you can call metal bending a cheap power up either. And finally, blood bending. Just like with metal bending, I believe it was exclusively designed to show us Katara's character growth, to the point that we actually only see it used in a couple of episodes with one of them being the time that we learn of it in the first place. The only real use outside of this episode is when Katara goes to confront her mother's murderer. In this episode, she is completely fueled by revenge, and bloodbending shows us that. She is no longer the motherly character that we've seen throughout the show. This journey has hardened her just as much as the rest of our characters, and she is not afraid to face this man that has haunted her all this time. We could of course analyze the meaning of this power further, but for the sake of this video, I believe it's a bit of a mute point. When speaking of Avatar as a whole, I want to emphasize once again that this sort of power progression only works in a finite setting. If the series were to continue after the finale, Aang would have already been a fully realized Avatar. While there may be more threats, he would have already reached the power cap. The same is true for Zuko. He has mastered firebending. There is nowhere more to go for him in terms of raw bending power. And just as a closing thought for the Avatar part of this video, look at the power progression of Legend of Korra, where she had mastered all of the elements very early in the series. Firstly, we got spirit bending, which really didn't make too much sense. But the rest of the show was about her character rather than raw power. But anyway, it's time to move on to Jojo. In the introduction, I mentioned that I view Jojo's power growth as essentially infinite. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about it, Jojo doesn't actually get more powerful throughout the show. This only changes for the very final episode, but we will talk about that a little bit later. So firstly, if he doesn't get any more powerful, why does it feel like there are still high stakes? 
Well, I believe there are a few important reasons. Firstly, just like with Avatar, the series has a clear goal. They need to reach and defeat Dio. Now you might say that if it's just like Avatar, then why is this one infinite? Well, it's because the way on how you get there is different. You could add 30 other stand users between the existing ones and the format would still work. This is because there is a power progression cycle for every single villain we meet. Let me explain what I mean. When a new enemy is introduced, we see Jotaro fight him and often lose, because the stand user has some sort of specific ability that allows him to win. We then see our gang learn more about the enemy, and ultimately see them win by exploiting one of its weaknesses, by still using the same powers they've always had. I guarantee if you switched around some of the villains and didn't know the proper order, you would not be able to tell which one goes first, and this is in no way a bad thing. By writing these mini arcs as their own power escalation cycles, you always have something to reach for, and so the stakes always feel high. The series can even introduce seemingly extremely overpowered abilities, but they are always somewhat limited, which keeps them balanced in the wider universe. Let's take the most extreme example, stopping time. This too is balanced by the range of their stands and the fact that you can only stop time for a few seconds. Even a seemingly insane power can be introduced, yet still it's possible to overcome without coming up some bogus way of beating it. Tiny spoilers for part 4, but there are times where Jojo's time stopping ability is useless, even in protecting himself. The problem with this sort of constant power cycle is that writing it is extremely difficult. If not done right, after a while things just become stale and boring. In a setting like Jojo's, you never really know what to expect, so there is much more room for random and sometimes downright weird enemy stands. But for some universes trying to keep tension high without constantly raising the power cap is very difficult. Notably, many survival series. But we will talk about that in part 2 of this mini-series of Escalation of Power and Odds. And that is it for this video. I'd really like to hear your thoughts about this one for sure, so if you have anything to add, please let me know in the comments as usual. It was a ton of fun to put together and nerd out over a few of my favorite series. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.